Um, it is a blessing. It's a blessing to be here. Um, can you believe it's already the end of August? Uh, time is flying so fast, and there's always changes. This week has been very eventful. Uh, not only, I, I guess, every country is waiting for when the swine flu hits, and there is a lot of fear and trepidation in places. Uh, this week also, there was a passing of uh, Kim Dae-jung Tetong-yong, the president Kim Dae-jung here in Korea. When we came, uh, we came over 12 years ago, it was just when he began his administration. And so he was uh, actually the first democratically elected uh, civilian president. And so he, he has a special place uh, here in Korean history. So it's very, been a very eventful week and a very eventful year thus far. One of the blessings that I've had this year is uh, to, to have a goal. I mean, do you remember what your New Year's resolution was? New Year's resolution. Uh, usually people, they, there's, they have a little clock about how long will it last? How long will I keep my New Year's resolution? Well, I've been very, very good this year, and I've, I'm proud of myself if I can say that. But um, I had a personal goal to read the Bible through, just read the Bible through completely. Not once, but twice. Once in Korean, and then also once in English. And I'm happy to say that I'm on schedule. And it has been really uh, just a joy. And it's amazing how I relearned some things that I had forgotten, particularly about the history of Israel. It is, uh, it's just amazing and actually mind-boggling to, to read about the history of Israel, to think about all that God did in taking one family and then four generations of that family in taking 70 people down to Egypt and in Egypt for 430 years, living as slaves, people with no identity, no culture, nothing. And from out of that group, that, that 70 became two and a half million. And uh, God led them through Moses and through his own leadership into the promised land. And bit by bit, they, they formed a, a tremendous nation, according to God's promise. And under, of course, under King David and under his son, King Solomon, you had a mighty nation, probably the most powerful nation that's ever existed because God blessed them. God blessed them. But as you continue reading, you see how they forgot God and they turned their back on God. And it got to the point, and it was so bad, that a holy and righteous God had to bring judgment upon them. And it's just unthinkable about what, what God did to bring them into the land. And ultimately, God himself allowed, allowed all that to be destroyed. And the people were removed from their land because they were unfaithful to him. And what's even more incredible is it, we just had a, a Bible creed that the people, had they even forgot God's word. They forgot the law of Moses. The book of Exodus, or excuse me, Leviticus is all filled with, this, with all the requirements for the, the feast and the festivals and the sacrifices. And they forgot all that. They, for, they literally forgot the, the, the law of Moses that had been written down. They, were, they became completely blind to their own sin. And, and even when God sent them prophets... And they gave warnings, thus saith the Lord, turn back to me or destruction's coming. You know what? They ignored the prophets. They even persecuted them. They even killed them. Can you imagine? God's people, God's people falling to such a state spiritually that they had come to that point. Finally, in the end, a just and a holy God had had enough. And he allowed the nation that he had built to be destroyed. He brought Assyria to come and to capture the
the northern, the northern kingdom as Israel had become divided to capture the northern kingdom. They took those people away with hooks in their nose, chained, and they led them like cattle from, from Israel to Assyria and took other people and moved them to the land. And even in the midst of that, as the northern kingdom fell and other prophets came, like, like uh, uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah, speaking to them, turn back, turn back, those in the southern kingdom would not turn back. And God said, okay, Babylon's coming, and you're going to be removed from the land. And the people had made up prophets, and they, they had their own prophets. They were religious they, they had some services going on, but they also served other gods. And the prophet said, no, 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 there won't be any destruction. And like Jeremiah said, that's not true. There will be, and there was. And it was so terrible. All the cities of, of uh, southern Israel were destroyed. Everybody came into Jerusalem, the last stronghold. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and the Babylonians, they sieged the city for over two years. And there was famine. There was such famine inside the city that mothers even ate their own children. They died of warfare. They died of disease. They died of pestilence. They died of famine. Finally, the walls were breached. The walls were broken down. And the city, the walls, everything was destroyed. Even the temple of the Lord was burned. There was absolutely almost nothing left, and the people were taken in chains and naked all the way to Babylon. You know where Babylon is, right? In Iraq. All the way from, from Israel, all the way over to modern-day Iraq, Babylon. As glorious as the history of Israel had been under David and under Solomon, they became as great in their indignity. From the United Kingdom to its destruction in only 345 years. And it was simply unbelievable that God's people could become so spiritually arrogant and deceived that they would ignore God's warnings. The people of Israel were in spiritual crisis, and they did not even know it. I want you to follow along that PowerPoint in today's message, Recognition of Spiritual Crisis, and focusing on Psalm 51 and other uh, verses as well. And, yeah, okay. Yeah, the, uh, I, I want to speak to you this morning or this afternoon for a few minutes on, on spiritual crisis, actually recognition of spiritual crisis. I think it's not only a uh, practical topic, but it's also a very timely one, a relevant one. In societies like Korea and in America, where we have so many churches and so many Christians that it's so easy for us to become complacent. It's, uh, it's so easy for us to just go with the flow. Our culture, our environment, they have a powerful effect upon us. I was, uh, I was amazed. I went, to, uh, I went to America this summer, and uh, actually in almost 13 years, I've only spent about 16, 16 uh, months in America. And it is amazing to see how fast things are changing, how, um, how, how fast things are changing, not only in so many different ways. I think many of you are familiar with the frog in the kettle analogy. How many of you uh, are brave souls have ever eaten frog legs before? Anybody? Don't be shy. You got keguri twitari, mashinail. The first time I ate frog, le frog legs, actually people in America in, this, in the rural part do eat that. First time I ate it was in Korea. Then huichi, huichi beso, in the, uh, at the sushi restaurant. And, you know, a frog, they like cold water. Well, if you take, if you take the frog, put him in hot water, what's he going to do? Jump right out. No, you put him in the pan, nembi. You put him in there in what? 
water that is, that is comfortable to him and slowly turn it up. And he adjusts to it and slowly turn it up. And guess what? Before long, you're ready to eat. Frog in the kettle. Another side of this is seen in this, in this statement. Don't ask a fish to explain what water is like. Okay? Don't, all you PhDs, to watch you say, oh, help me out here. Don't ask a fish to explain what water is like. Why? Because that's all he knows. He has no outside perspective. You know, folks, we don't know what, we don't know what a straight line is until we see it compared to what? A crooked line. For a fish, all he knows is the water. Ask him to describe it, he can't do it. We don't, are, typically, we don't recognize or we don't critically question what is taking place around us. We just assume that what, what we're experiencing is normal. You could call it the new normal. I want to tell you, after being in America this summer, my goodness, the new, no, the new normal. Um, I've, it, is, it, it is surprising to me. Ever, I mean, tattoos have been around, but I've not seen so many women before with tattoos. And I mean, I don't mean in hidden places, but I mean out front, even on the neck. That takes some getting used to. Um, and, and, and I mean, seriously, not just young people. I mean, what, what we say, ajimoni, ajima. <laughs> we see all kinds of people from all walks of life. And it's almost the new normal. And so people get used to it. This is the way that it should be. But folks, there's a failure to, to be self-aware. And that failure to be self-aware is a reflection of our fallen human nature. Remember, as Christians, we have God, the Holy Spirit, living inside us. We just sang about that a few minutes ago. God, the Holy Spirit, living in us, if we're believers. Do you recall what Jesus taught the disciples about the ministry and the, and the role of the Holy Spirit? Let's look at, uh, on the screen, you can follow along as I read these, these verses. Yeah, Talmud. Uh, John chapter 16, verses 6 and 7. This is Jesus speaking to the disciples. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, that I go back to heaven. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. The Holy Spirit, the helper, will do what? He will, convict, he, he will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. Tell me. And also, uh, the same chapter, Jesus speaking. And when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For, we, uh, for he will not speak on his own initiative. Whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me. The Holy Spirit will glorify God the Son. For he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. In all these things, in all things that the Father has are mine. Jesus says, all things that God the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he takes of mine, the Holy Spirit takes of mine, and will disclose it to you. You have a connection with God Almighty. God the Holy Spirit living inside you, guiding you into all the truth. You want to know what the truth is? You have to be connected to God Almighty through the Holy Spirit of God and through Jesus Christ. Amen? The Spirit of truth, the helper, God the Holy Spirit. Christians are not alone. Jesus said that he wouldn't leave us as orphans. We're not alone. We have God the Holy Spirit living inside us, guiding us, teaching us. God wants us to live successfully according to his truth. That's his plan for your life. Chashingam. 
Self-confidence. Do you have self-confidence? Do you have self-confidence? Are you optimistic person? Pessimistic? Is the glass? You're going to have full on you. <laughs> this is below. But is it? What kind of person are you? Is the glass half full or half empty? You should say, you should look on the positive side. Let me put it that way. God wants us to live successfully. And he wants us, in, in, in part of the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, is transforming us into the image, the very character of Christ. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3 says this. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is, what's the next word? Liberty. There is liberty. There is freedom. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being, what? Transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit, the Lord is a spirit. We all are being what? Transformed into the same image. Living our lives as living our lives as closely as possible to how Jesus would is the standard that God expects of us. In the Old Testament again, in, in Exodus, Moses met privately with God. And there was an interesting uh, effect that came through that. As he met privately with God, and as he came back down to the people, guess what? His face was shining. And the people were, the people were afraid. And so Moses began to wear a veil. He wore a veil. And this is, uh, go back to the scripture, one, yeah, one, uh, yeah, one page. It says that we, with unveiled face, beholding as in the mirror the glory of the Lord, we see God's glory are being transformed. We are being transformed. We are being changed. Just as Moses was being affected from the presence of God, we should be transformed. We should be different people. That's what Apostle Paul taught in 2 Corinthians 5, that we are new creatures. God, the Holy Spirit, living inside us, changing us. Okay. Tell me. The people saw it and they were afraid. And, and so we should be naturally just chogum shik, chogum shik, bit by bit changed into the image of Christ. Nobody's perfect. But now we focus more on the problem. However, guess what? We can and we often do reject the Holy Spirit's leadership. Tom, Tom screen. Um, okay. Tom, okay. We often reject the Holy Spirit's leadership, like Israel of old. We allow ourselves to become what spiritually complacent, and this naturally leads us to a place of of spiritual crisis. This afternoon, I'd like for us to speak just a, a few minutes about recognizing, recognizing a spiritual crisis in our lives. To do this, we first have to know what the symptoms of a spiritual crisis, or what, what is uh, the spiritual crisis, the symptoms of a spiritual crisis. Before a doctor can accurately, what, diagnose an illness, he has to know what the symptoms are. And so that's what I want to do right now. I want us to think about the symptoms of a spiritual crisis. And as we go through a list of what I, I call symptoms, I want you to please honestly reflect upon your own life and your personal habits. These symptoms are not in any particular order, and it's not an exhaustive list, but it's what I think are very common, common symptoms or indicators of a Christian encountering or in spiritual crisis. So let's look at these symptoms. No joy. No joy. This is what David wrote in Psalm 51. David said, create in me. In fact, let's read this together. 
let's read this together in one voice. She Jack. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. David was at the point in his life where, and we'll talk about it later, but he had committed some very, very serious sins. And he had a period of rebellion in his life that lasted well over a year. And here David is praying a prayer of repentance. And he says, he prays to God, restore to me the joy of your salvation. There is joy in having a relationship with God Almighty. Amen? Salvation. Salvation is another word for relationship. You are my kuanja. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. And there should be a joy in this relationship. We move. We, when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we become the adopted sons and daughters of God. And he becomes what? We, we, we go from God or some, con, some concept, some uh, ethereal concept, some vague abstract concept to what? Hananimaboji, our Father, we pray the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven. Father God. He is our Heavenly Father. We are His spiritual children. We have joy in this relationship. And David yet fell into sin. And he prays after a period of rebellion, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Is there joy in your life? Is your relationship with God one that brings you joy? Joy is not, joy and happiness are different. Joy is not determined by the uh, circumstances that you're in. Joy is different. It's a fruit of the Spirit if you look in Galatians. Joy. If there's no joy in your life, then you have to really examine and say, where am I exactly in my relationship with God? Next, lack of prayer. Lack of prayer. Paul wrote in Romans 14, 21, and whatever is not of faith is what? Is sin. Whatever is not of faith is sin. Hebrews eleven six. 6, and without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a what? Rewarder of those who seek him. Why pray? Wait a minute, God knows everything. Oh, we don't need to pray. Oh, God, God doesn't care about that. Swine flu, it's not too bad. You said Korean government has plenty of inventory of the Tamiflu. You get sick, you take medicine, right? What do we need God for? Don't worry about it. You got big decisions in your life? It'll be in. Don't worry about it. Just go ahead and go. Don't, don't bother God. He's got, you know, he's got important things. He's got to take care of Venus and Neptune and Saturn. That's the way I used to think when I was a kid. Lack of prayer. Lack of prayer. What is lack of prayer? It's also a lack of faith. It's also a lack of awareness. It's also a symptom of spiritual crisis. Oh, I'll do it in my own strength. I don't need to do that. Go ahead. Do your own thing. Proverbs says, Proverbs 16.9 says, The mind of man plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. If you don't have time, oh, I'm busy. I'm busy. I'm busy. I'm at the, busy at the Hagwan. I'm busy at our research institute. I'm busy at the Tehakyo. I'm busy at university. I don't have time to pray. I don't have time to pray. Really? Whatever is not of faith is sin. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. You want to please God? You do not do it in your own strength. You seek his strength. You seek his blessing. You seek his leadership. You're mindful of his presence in your life. 
the people of Israel had gone completely the other way. No joy, lack of prayer, and also another symptom, indifference to the spiritual conditions of others. Indifference to the spiritual conditions of others. James 4.17 Therefore to him who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, finish the sentence. To him what? It is, what's the word? Sin. To him who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. Oh, no, 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 Pastor Hale, I'm, I'm busy. You, don't, you do not understand. My supervisor says I have to get this paper in and I don't have time for it. And besides, I don't like the guy anyway. Okay? I don't care what his spiritual condition is. I'm busy. I don't care. I, I'm, I've got my own thing going on. You know, I can, I compare, I, I'm concerned about me. You know what they, what, what's the middle letter in the word sin? Come on, you English speakers, tell me, what's the middle, of, middle letter in the word sin? I, I, me, my. I'm concerned about me. I don't care about her. I'm concerned about me. I don't care about him. I'm concerned about my life. And we say, Urishiku, my, my family. I don't care about them. Yet, why did Jesus come to earth? Why did Jesus come to earth? Why did God give you your, your salvation? If you look in uh, Psalm 67, he talks about God blesses us so that the end of the earth may be blessed. You become a blessing to others. Indifferent, indifference toward the spiritual conditions of others and this is where most Christians are we just get so wrapped up in our own lives in Nai Chukbuk God bless me me I me ma you know a good chorus when you okay Ilben when you lead the chorus don't do any just me 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 okay one note one tone that's the way most of us are indifference toward the spiritual conditions of others. That's a symptom of spiritual crisis. Also, not offended, Tomsky, not offended by the world. Not offended by the world. This is also from the book of James. James writing very strongly, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Friendship to the world is hostility toward God. Therefore, whoever wishes... To be a friend of the world. You want to be a friend of the world? You like having friends? You want to be a friend of the world? Makes himself an enemy of God. One Su, enemy of God. Folks, again, frog in the kettle. Uh, experiencing things, our culture, our changing culture, rapidly changing culture, our globalization urbanization. You can jump on a plane and go anywhere in this world in 24 hours. It's absolutely amazing. This type of meeting right here was almost near, practically impossible 20 years ago. Now we can, it's amazing to, to, be, to be in a congregation of so many different countries, languages and cultures. However, not offended, I you go back, please. Not offended by the world. Not offended by the world. The word of God. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to, to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Okay, we can live with tattoos and piercings, okay? Some of our Christian friends have very um, good tattoos in a, in a sense, very creative. However, is everything permissible? Is everything okay? It's very hard to go counterculture. It's very hard to stand up and, 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 and go counterculture and put yourself out there as a target. 
yesterday or day before yesterday, the evan evangelical Lutheran denomination in America, in America, they made a decision. They said gays and they said sexually active gays and lesbians can serve as clergy within their denomination. Okay, one more time. Sexually active gays and lesbians can serve as clergy within their denomination as long as they're in committed relationships. Now, my friends, I'm going to be very straight with you. There's, abs there's not one word in this book right here that permits, says one thing positive about the LGBS, lesbian, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered. That's all the rage in America right now. Not one word in this scripture. And here you have the leadership of a denomination say it's okay. Already in the, in the Episcopal denomination, they've already gone that way. And it's popular. No, no, no. We want to be tolerant. Diversity. Tolerant. We, we have to accommodate. We're changing. Folks, there are some things that are a absolutely black and white. There are, of course, sin is in the world. Of course, there's conditions people may have. But generally speaking, the gender that you're born with is the gender that, that you are. And folks, we, we change the rules. We, we, we change the rules constantly. Our cultures do, and we say, well, it's okay. It's okay. I went with this church with a mission trip uh, January 2008. We were in uh, Thailand. Uh, English speakers say uh, Pattaya, and Korean speakers say Pattaya. And if you've been to Thailand, you know that there are so many cross-dressers. And uh, it's, when you go to the Philippines, it's, you know, very, very common as well. And there in the hotel every morning, you know, males are dressed as females and they're serving and all that. And in that culture, that Buddhist culture, Quintana, it's okay. It's all okay. And most of our, most of our, the, the missionaries from this church and many, many deacons and all that, most everybody, it is beautiful at, at Patia. Pattaya, beautiful, gorgeous, the scenery. Folks, in me, it's offensive. It's offensive. And it's like, well, okay, you're just a, you know, you're just trying to be a sour person. Why don't you just, you know, forget about everything else and just look at the beautiful ocean and look at all this. Folks, no, no. Because there are certain standards that do not change. There are some truths that are timeless. You just set a Bible creed. Indestructible, incorruptible. It says the seed of the word of God. I would, I would remove seed out of that and say the word of God. There are, there are values that never change. No matter what the culture says, no matter what some kind of left-wing scientist says, that invents the latest theory. Offense, uh, offended by the world. You, friends with the world, you cannot please everyone, especially as a Christian. You represent God's standards. And here, such a strong verse, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself to be an enemy of God. An enemy of God. And by the way, what does God do to his enemies? Hmm? Interesting, John chapter, John chapter 12, as Jesus came into Jerusalem for the final time, it says this, and it talks about Jesus' three and a half year ministry. He had done all the miracles. People had seen. He had raised Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus dead three days. And he comes out of the tomb. And people see it. And you know what? The chief priest and the religious leader said, you know what? We not only have to kill Jesus, we have to kill Lazarus. Because guess what? He's a walking testimony. 
And as Jesus came and the people were praising him, guess what? In John chapter 12, verses 42 and 43, it says, Nevertheless, many, many, even of the rulers, believed in him. They believed in Jesus. They believed that he's, he was the Messiah. But because of the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they were not confessing him. Baptism, what is the purpose of a baptism ceremony? It is a public confession. I am a Christian. I am a follower of Jesus. That's what it is. It's a public testimony. And yet the, religious, the Jewish religious leaders, they were not confessing him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. I am a Jewish religious leader. The synagogue is the center of the of, uh, social and religious life. My family, we, we come from a heritage. It is a position of honor. How can I, I'm not going to confess. No, no, no. I, I love the approval of men more than the approval of God. Friends, God will believe, God will test you on this. Make no mistake about it. And he's, even as Joshua challenged the people before they go into the, before they cross the Jordan River into the promised land, Joshua challenged the people. And he said in Joshua 24, 15, he said, choose you this day whom you're, whom you're going to serve. When you cross over into that land, who are you going to serve? Jehovah God or the, or the false gods of the people of the land? Folks, being a Christian is not easy. Amen? Being a Christian is not easy. If you want an easy time of it, look, then just play games. Sleep through, you know, um, sleepwalk through life. Go through the motions. But if you say, I'm a child of God, I want to be a spirit-filled Christian, I'm going to live for the glory of the Lord, you are going to face difficulties. And if you're at the point where you're not offended by the world, men and women, you may have spiritual crisis going on in your life. Next, selfishness. And we'll, we'll go quickly. Selfishness, Matthew 6, verses 20, 21. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Everybody wants to be rich. But I tell you, there's a lot of miserable rich people. Where we used to live in Korea, guess what? In, four, in, in less than uh, three years, we had a major flood. And we also had a wildfire. Uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, some America, American friends... There was a light, they live in a Chutik in a house, and there was a lightning strike. And it started, it started a fire in the attic. And the, uh, the police, the uh, fire department came, and of course they spray water and they put the fire out. Well, guess what? It's a beautiful house. It's not beautiful anymore. All, it, it wasn't a huge fire, but guess what? The smoke and the water ruins everything. And if you're concentrating on things, on things, you, you have to understand how temporary that is. God tells us to store up treasures for ourselves where? In heaven, where nothing can touch it, nothing can happen to it. There's no, there's no floods in heaven. There's no, at that time, it tepung rusa. There's no typhoon rusa. There's no wildfires. Store up treasure for yourself in heaven. What is treasure? Well, treasure is activity. It's more than money. It's our time. It's our energy. It's our hopes. It's our dreams. It's what we're focused upon. And yet, all too often, again, that, that me, me, me. I, me, my. Me. It's all, all about selfishness. 
we have to be very careful. Talmanin, next symptoms, not, not studying the Bible, not studying the Bible. Even uh, David, uh, David wrote in Psalm 119, with all my heart I have sought you. Do not let me wander from your commandments. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. Folks, God has done an amazing thing. We have his word written down for us. If you live in Korea, you live in America, it's in a language you can understand. Do you realize many, many places of the world do not have the Bible translated in their language? If I gave this book to somebody, they can't even read it. We have it in our language, the very word of God, the eternal word of God. Elsewhere, the, it says a flower fades, grass withers, the flowers fade. The word of our God lasts forever. Endures forever. And David says, Your word I've treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. Jesus said, that your, Thy word is truth. Your word is truth. This is God's written revelation of Himself. Not studying the Bible. What is that saying? I don't have time for you. I'm too busy. I, I, I'm going to take care of my own life. I know how to live my, my own life better than you do. Not studying the Bible. We talked so far, no joy, lack of prayer, indifference toward the spiritual conditions of others. Not offended by the world, selfishness, not studying the Bible. Oh, here comes a fun one. Overly critical of other Christians. Did you hear Rachel sing up here today? <laughs> Did you hear her? Uh, she's my daughter. I can still pick on her, okay? Critical of other Christians. Oh, this is the fun part. Don't you like to pick on each other and take pot shots at each other? Matthew 7, verses 2, and, uh, two through 4. For in the way you judge, well, let's stop there. The English word judge and the Greek word, the biblical word judge, are different. Okay, judge in a biblical sense, means condemn. It means to assume the role of a judge and condemn. Okay? In the, in the way that you judge or condemn, you will be judged. You will be condemned. And for by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck, at the splinter, we're talking wood, at the splinter, that is, in the, that is in your brother's eye and do not notice the log, the huge piece of wood that's in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, here, let me take my tweezers and I'm going to get that little splinter out of your eye. And behold, the log is in your own eye. All too often, I, I, uh, I uh, enjoy getting on the internet. I'm a member of some blogs. I'm like the priest at some of these blogs. I'm the troublemaker, the Christian, the Christian fundamentalist troublemaker sometimes. And on my football blog, Green Bay Packers, um, sometimes I share with these things, and, and they always they complain about Christians. Oh, Christians are hypocrites. Christians are hypocrites. You know, the worst thing you can be is a hypocrite. Well, you know what? A lot of times they're right. We are hypocrites. We are hypocrites. And we, that we, anytime something somebody says as a believer or in church, we need to do this, the first voice of opposition is from another Christian. And we do. We do lose perspective. And we're overly critical of our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Finally, the last symptoms of... of uh, spiritual crisis, and this is scary, sinning without repentance. Sinning without repentance. Yeah. This could, ha could this happen to you? Absolutely. In these verses that follow, they should really scare you. This is um, 
This is from Acts chapter 13, looking back at the life of David. Then they asked for a king. The people of Israel, they had Jehovah God as king. And you know what? They said, no, no, no. We want to be like all the other nations. Japan's got a king. Korea's got a king. England's got a king. We want to be like all the other nations. We want a king. They asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the king, uh, the, the Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. And after he had removed him, Saul was not faithful. God removed him. He raised up David. Yeah, tell me. He raised up David to be their king, concerning whom he also testified. God spoke of David and said, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do my, all my will. From the descendants of this man, from David's descendants, who comes? According to the promise, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus, Jesus Christ of the line of David. God says, yeah, tell me, God says that David was a man after my heart. And yet, stop and think about David's life. He had the capacity to commit great sins. Great sins such as lying, adultery, and even premeditated murder. He was also stubborn. He re David had a special gift of the Holy Spirit at that time. He rejected the Holy Spirit's leadership for well over a year. And he did not repent of his sin for a very, very long time. And he suffered so much because of his pride. David the king, he already had, uh, seven, he already had seven wives. He comes to Jerusalem. He takes more wives. He takes concubines. And then one of his most faithful uh, servants, David was a military man, one of his elite forces. He saw the wife of, of, of very, very special elite forces member. And he took her. If you remember what it says in the, the, the last of the Ten Commandments, it says, do not covet, covet your neighbor's wife. And that's what he did. And then when... And then as the scandal grew, as she, as she was, became pregnant, and then he said, man, I've got to cover this thing up. And he planned the death of one of his most faithful servants, premeditated murder, because he had lost his way. He was in spiritual crisis. This is the man of whom God said, a man after my own heart. Folks, this is such a strong warning for us. Because if David could fall this low, so can you and I. So can you and I. We are also as extremely vulnerable as he is. So what happened to the nation of Israel is a strong warning for all of us. Even their most famous leader, David, had the capacity for tremendous moral weaknesses, moral, moral weakness. Ultimately, the people of Israel did what? They accommodated themselves to the culture, to the cultures of the, in the religious cultures of the people that, in whom they surrounded them, and they forgot all about God. And even though God sent witnesses and prophets to them, they persecuted those people. They rejected God's voice, God's truth, and they remained proud. And they fell into serious, such serious spiritual crisis they did not even understand, didn't recognize their, the bankrupt, how bankrupt their spiritual position had become. And the results, my friends, were so devastating. This nation that God Almighty had built through miracles after miracle after miracle, it was the very envy of the world. God, a righteous and holy God, 
utterly destroyed it. So much so that when people passed by the ruins of Jerusalem and they saw the few people that were left broken and naked and starving to death and they just shook their heads. You remember the pictures of Buchenwald and Auschwitz, the Jewish people that were starved. That's what it was. And a righteous and holy God said, this is what justice demands. And then in his love and his mercy, he restored those people. And he forgave them. And he restored them. And that's what he... And thank God we live in the age of grace. And we have a God that cares for us. And yet, my friends, we have that same capacity to forget and to walk away from God. How should we respond when we realize that our relationship with God is in crisis? We should respond with honesty, humility, faith, and hope. Next screen. All right, next screen. Our hope, there is forgiveness. There is forgiveness. Tell me. Lamentations 3. This is what Jeremiah wrote. Why should any living mortal or any man offer complaint in view of his sins? In other words, because of my sins and God's bringing me punishment, what complaint? Say, oh, it's not right, it's not fair. No. Let us examine and probe our ways and let us, what's the last four words? Return to the Lord. Let's... Read the underlying part for me. Let us examine and probe our ways and let us return to the Lord. Return to the Lord. Isaiah 55. This is what Isaiah speaking to this, this people that are hurting in Babylon. And he says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man is thought, no, stop. Let the wicked forsake his way, his activity. Stop. Stop the activity. And the unrighteous man, his, what? What's the word? Thoughts. You change your mind. Repentance, the word repentance, it literally means U-turn. Okay? When you're driving in Korea, there's U-turns everywhere. You, you miss your road, what do you do? You turn, hey, you have to do a U-turn. Repentance means a change of not only your thoughts, but your actions. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord. And he will have, what? Compassion on him. And to our God, he will abundantly pardon. Hallelujah abundantly pardon, abundantly forgive. In 1 John 1, 9, very familiar. If we, can, tell me, if we confess our sins, He, God, is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from 50% of your unrighteousness. What's it say? All unrighteousness. Hallelujah. You want to be forgiven? You want to be in right relationship with God Almighty? Confess your sins. Ask Him to forgive you of your sins. Folks, God wants to bless us. He wants to bless you in so many ways. Chashimgam. Again, self-confidence. You are conquerors. You are winners. You are victors in Jesus Christ. If you do things his way. You want to go your own way? You may have material success. You may have even riches. And you'll have an emptiness in your soul that will not be filled up. God wants to bless you. God wants you to, God wants you to walk with him each and every day. But the responsibility for receiving those blessings lies with you. 
you have to put yourself in a position to receive those blessings. Let's pray. Let's bow our heads. Let's bow our heads and pray.